We've been discussing discrete dynamical systems, but to this point the focus has been mostly on linear systems. Now a market economy is far too complex an object to be described reasonably well by a linear model, so in this segment we'll begin a discussion of nonlinearity. We'll start with the simplest case of nonlinear maps that are one-dimensional, and see how these can be analyzed by using linear approximations, at least in the neighborhood of a fixed point. Then we'll go back to a discussion of conjugacy and stability, and this will bring us to a discussion of higher dimensional systems in Euclidean space, for which we'll state the linearization theorem. And this tells us when and how we can use a linear approximation to examine the stability of fixed points in a nonlinear system. Now one thing I'd like to emphasize throughout this segment, and especially at the end, is that linearization is a technique that gives us local information in the neighborhood of a fixed point and tells us nothing about the global properties of a nonlinear system. And failing to appreciate this fact can lead us to make incorrect inferences from the properties of a linearized model. So let's begin with one-dimensional nonlinear maps. So consider the dynamical system xf, where x is a subset of the real numbers and f is continuously differentiable. Now for any fixed point x star of this system, let's consider the first order Taylor expansion around x star, which we'll denote by g of x. So this is just the Taylor expansion with all second order and higher terms deleted. Now you can see that g of x is an affine map on R with the property that g of x star is equal to f of x star. And since x star is a fixed point of f, this immediately implies that it's also a fixed point of g. Now when x is close to x star, g provides a linear approximation. And the key question we want to address is the following. Under what conditions can the local stability properties of x star in the nonlinear system be deduced from the stability properties of x star in the linear system? Now the properties of x star in the linear system are well understood. and We've dealt with these already. In this system, x star is Lyapunov stable if the slope of the function f at x star is less than or equal to 1, it's globally asymptotically stable if it's strictly less than 1, and it's unstable if it's greater than 1. Now I'm going to prove in a moment the claim that in the original nonlinear system, the fixed point x star is locally asymptotically stable if the slope of the function f at x star is strictly less than 1, it's unstable if the slope of the function is greater than 1, and if the slope is exactly equal to 1, the stability of the nonlinear system can't be deduced from the properties of the linear system. So let's prove this claim. We're going to use the mean value theorem to do this, so let's recall what this says. If f is a continuous function on the interval a, b, and differentiable in the interior of this interval, such that the slope of the function at c is equal to the slope of the line connecting the two endpoints corresponding to a and b. So just keep this in mind as we proceed. Now suppose that the absolute value of the slope of the function f at the fixed point x star is equal to some number k strictly less than 1 then we can find another number L that lies strictly between k and 1. Now since f is continuously differentiable, there must exist some delta positive and some closed interval x star minus delta x star plus delta such that for all points x in this interval, the slope of the function at x has absolute value less than L. Now recall the mean value theorem and note that for any x in this interval i, there exists some number c between x and x star such that the slope of the function at c is equal to the expression shown on the slide. Now since x star is a fixed point, we can replace f of x star with x star to get the expression shown. And hence for any x in the interval i, the distance between f of x and x star is less than l times the distance between x and x star. And this of course means that the image of x under f also lies in the interval i. Now we can repeat this argument using f of x as a starting point instead of x and we see that the distance between f squared of x and x star is less than l times the distance between f of x and x star, which of course means that it's less than l squared times the distance between x and x star. Now you'll recognize this kind of reasoning which we used when we discussed contractions in an earlier segment. Continuing in this way, we get an upper bound for the distance between the image of x under the nth iterate of f and x star. And since l is strictly less than 1, you can see that the sequence of points fn of x converges to x star. In other words, x star is locally asymptotically stable. As long as the seed of an orbit is within the interval i, the orbit will converge to x star. Now this shows that when the slope of the function f at x star is strictly less than 1, then x star is locally asymptotically stable in the nonlinear system. You can use a very similar argument to show that if this slope is greater than 1, then the rest point at x star is unstable in the nonlinear system. But what if we have the special case in which the slope of the function has absolute value exactly equal to 1? In that case, the stability properties of the fixed point can't be deduced from those of the linear approximation. And you can see this by looking at the three examples on the slide. Each of these examples has a fixed point at x star equal to 0. 
And in each case, the slope of the function at x star has absolute value equal to 1. But in the first example, we have a sink, in the second a source, and in the third case, we have an unstable fixed point that is neither a sink or a source. Just check that these claims are true. So in the knife edge case, where the slope of the function f has absolute value exactly equal to 1 at a fixed point, the linear approximation at the fixed point isn't helpful in deducing the stability properties of the nonlinear system. Now we need to think about how this might generalize to higher dimensional systems, and we'll do that later in this segment. But first I want to return to the issue of topological conjugacy and its relation to stability. So recall that we define two systems, x, f, and y, g, as conjugate if there exists a homeomorphism h from x to y such that the composition of h with f is equal to the composition of g with h. And we also showed in an earlier segment that if there exists such a homeomorphism h, then the composition of h with the nth iterate of f is equal to the nth iterate of g composed with h. Now here's a claim that we made earlier without proof, and we'll briefly go over the proof now. Suppose x, f, and y, g are conjugate, then the point x star is an attractor in the first system if and only if h of x star is an attractor in the second system. So let's prove this. Suppose x star is an attractor in the first system, then there exists an open set u in x such that the orbit that begins at x converges to x star for all points x in u. This is just the definition of an attractor. Now since the sequence of points fn of x converges to x star and h is a continuous function, the sequence of images of these points must converge to the image of x star. Now define v as the image of u and note that v must be open. And here we're using the fact that h is a homeomorphism which means that both h and h inverse are continuous bijections. And since h inverse is a continuous function from y to x and v is the inverse image under this function of the set u in the codomain, v must be open. This is because the function is continuous if and only if the inverse image of every open set is open. Now take any x in the open set u, then the image of this point h of x must be contained in the open set v. This just follows from the fact that v is the image of u. Now to finish the proof, we'll just use the expression at the top of the slide, which tells us that h composed with the nth iterate of f is equal to the nth iterate of g composed with h. This tells us that the sequence g to the n of h of x must have the same limit as the sequence h of f to the n of x, which we know to be h of x star. In other words, any orbit that starts at some point h of x in v must converge to h of x star. So h of x star is locally asymptotically stable in the second dynamical system. Now let's consider higher dimensional systems in Euclidean space. Consider the system xf, where x is some subset of Rn and f is continuously differentiable. And let j of x denote the Jacobian matrix. So this is just the matrix of partial derivatives evaluated at the point x. Now we say that a fixed point x star of the system is hyperbolic if no eigenvalue of the Jacobian matrix when evaluated at x star has modulus exactly equal to 1. In other words, all eigenvalues of the system either lie within the unit circle or outside the unit circle in the complex plane. Now a linear approximation for f around x star is given by g of x as shown on the slide. And again, we are excluding terms that are second order or higher in the difference between x and x star. And here's the main result, which I'll state without proof. If x star is a hyperbolic fixed point of the dynamical system xf, then there exists a neighborhood u of x star, such that f and g are topologically conjugate on u. Now since g is a linear approximation, we know its stability properties just depend on the eigenvalues of the matrix j of x star. In particular, the fixed point x star in the linear approximation will be globally asymptotically stable if all eigenvalues of j of x star lie within the unit disk in the complex plane. And what this theorem says is that if the eigenvalues of j of x star all lie in the interior of the unit disk in the complex plane, then x star is locally asymptotically stable even in the nonlinear system. And furthermore, if one or more of the eigenvalues of j of x star lie outside the unit disk in the complex plane, then x star is unstable in the nonlinear system. So the local stability properties of the fixed point in the nonlinear system can be deduced from the stability properties of the linear approximation. And this is an extremely useful result as you can imagine. But it's important to emphasize that the linear approximation is informative about the stability of a fixed point only locally. It tells us nothing about global behavior. Now this is important because if you lose sight of this fact, you might make incorrect inferences about the properties of the nonlinear system 
by overgeneralizing from the properties of the linear approximation. Now there are two kinds of errors that might arise. First, suppose that you find that a fixed point is unstable in the linear approximation. Now this doesn't mean that you have an economically meaningless model. In the linear approximation, you'll get explosive trajectories, but in the nonlinear system, you'd only get divergence from the fixed point locally. In fact, there's a long tradition in business cycle theory of models that rely on local instability and nonlinearity to generate economic fluctuations without the need for shocks. This literature goes back to work by Samuelson, Kaletsky, and Kaldor in the 1930s and 40s, and later extended by people like Goodwin and Tobin. Now, these are not micro-founded models, so they don't get much attention these days. But they do have some interesting economic insights. In particular, they explore a vision of the capitalist economy that is characterized by local instability of steady growth, kept bounded by nonlinearities far away from equilibrium. And the second type of mistake that might arise if you take the linear approximation too literally is if the fixed point x star is stable in the linear approximation. Now this doesn't mean that in the nonlinear system you don't have interesting dynamics far away from equilibrium. In fact, there's another tradition in business cycle theory, going back to work by Axel Leon Hufford, which explores the concept of corridor stability. And this explores the idea that steady growth is stable as long as the economy is hit by small shocks but a large enough shock can give you a catastrophic movement away from the steady state. Now both these types of models rely on nonlinearities. These insights can't be captured by linear models. And they both rely on important differences between the nonlinear system and the linear approximation when you move far away from equilibrium. Now we'll explore some of these ideas in the next segment when I'll discuss complex dynamics, but I'll stop here for this segment.